Thank you so much, Ben. Hello, hello, everyone. Oh, I love the energy so much. It's so nice when you're here on a screen to hear all of you out there. And thank you so much to all of you and Stephen for having me. I love this conference and I'm really excited to be here today. And I'm going to talk about something that I love to talk about, and that is food. So I'm going to start my screen share and get my keynote up and running. And hoping everyone could see this screen. So I love to talk about nutrition and all of that, but today I'm going to focus more on food. So you've probably heard all of these wonderful, amazing things that happens when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, just from whatever hours you've spent so far in this amazing, wonderful conference. So today, instead of talking about the benefits, I want to talk more about like, now that you have this fabulous information, how do you implement this? How do you make this a part of your life? And I'm going to talk about all the details, the nutrition and the food part the delicious part and kind of dig deep into that. But of course I have to start with one slide just to summarize just some of the myriad health advantages of eating a whole food plant-based diet. There is so much in the literature that is expanding on a regular basis. I can't even believe the most amazing things that keep coming out every single day. And, um, but these are, this is like a summary slide of the benefits that have been really well substantiated over many, many years. And that is that a plant-based diet is the only diet that we've ever seen that actually reverses advanced stage cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes. It's also associated with a lower body mass index, lower body fat, lower overall mortality and mortality from ischemic heart disease, reduced medication requirements. This is one of my favorite ones because I was not taught this in graduate school or in my clinical rotations that you could ever get off medications or reduce medication use. My goal was what I was taught to be my goal was to mitigate the need to increase medication, to just slow down the disease process. But results are typical. And I see my clients regularly get off their medications so quickly, so amazingly that I have to have them contact their physician prior to starting with me and alert the physician that this may happen. Because, you know, if you're reducing your medication while you're on, you've got high blood pressure and you're on the medications or high blood sugar, it could actually be kind of risky. So it's quite extraordinary. I see it all the time and it makes me very, very happy. And, um, and the research supports it. So it's really amazing. It's also associated, of course, with sustainable weight management. And uh, I'll talk about this in my next talk. I'm going to talk about the Choose You Now diet uh, I think next week. But um, weight loss and weight management, you could lose weight in a, a lot of different ways, but a whole food plant-based diet is a really sustainable health promoting, I think it's the best way. It's also associated with the reduced incidence of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high blood sugar, reduced risk of certain cancers, especially colorectal cancer, reduced obesity, inflammatory markers, because this is the most anti-inflammatory way to eat. We're going to talk about that too. So basically a plant-based diet supports living longer, not just living longer. Okay. Here is my three step, simple approach to transitioning to a plant-based diet plan, practice, persist. So it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be really super simple. And I recommend starting out super simply. For example, start with what you know, you know, we've grown up or we've lived in a world where we were eating things that were plant-based, but we didn't really kind of think of it as plant-based. Like for instance, oatmeal or a PB and J or pasta with marinara sauce or a lentil chili. There's so many things that we've eaten over the years that were just naturally plant-based. We just kind of didn't put a name on it. So gravitate towards what, you know, the familiar that makes things really easy. The other thing is most of us are really creatures of habit. We may vary like our breakfast, maybe one or two different breakfasts every day, maybe three to four different lunches, maybe five to six different dinners in a week. But we are so creatures of habit that if you think about it like that, you really only need to find maybe eight or 10 new recipes or recipes you already know that are already plant-based that you love. So you only need a few baseline recipes to make this work ideally for you. And this is really super easy. So nowadays, oh my goodness, when I did this, you know, there really wasn't a lot of internet access or at all. 
but so I would go through cookbooks and I had to kind of figure it out. Now there are hundreds of thousands, at least of recipes at the touch of your finger. So you could find anything, anything you could ever want. You could find plant-based now online. So you find a recipe, you try it. If you love it, what I used to do is I'd put a little heart on it and I put it in a pile. If I didn't love it, I would either try to change it and see if it worked. If it didn't work, toss it and move on to the next one. There's no limit. We're going to talk about all the options. So find your recipes that you love, eight or 10 of them, and then practice, 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 right? You just, you get comfortable with making those recipes and, and then, you know, you persist. So if you want to start building in new recipes into your repertoire and just kind of cycling things in and out that you love, and then you can kind of broaden your skills. You can take a, a cooking class, or if you're already a chef, you could just kind of explore and expand. And it's super fun in the kitchen to kind of like figure that out. In fact, I didn't know how to cook ever. And then when I had to write my first book and I had six weeks to write an entire book and 50 recipes. And I was a mom of two little kids and I had to teach myself uh, cooking and recipe development. And I fell in love with it because it was so much fun. And there's so much you could do in the kitchen, which we're going to talk more about later. So anyway, plan, practice, persist, simple, simple. I like to think of it kind of like learning a new language. How many of you have learned a new language and you have to learn some new letters, right? So maybe some new letters. Sometimes it's the same letters, just looked a little different. So maybe some words. So think about that, like the ingredients, like maybe you haven't tried jackfruit or caviar lentils or red lentils, or I don't know, name a food or a food or a vegetable or something you have never tried, daikon radish. And you start to string these together into recipes, right? You could follow the template. You don't have to make it all up. That's kind of the real, real exciting part is that someone's already made it up for you. So you put it together, you find these recipes that you love, the new words and sentences and paragraphs, and you start to speak in that language, right? You start to recognize things. You start to go to a restaurant and go, oh, that would be, I could put this meal together. And then eventually, like anything, you become fluent. And once you're fluent, it's super simple. It's the way you think. You just, you kind of like, you're speaking that language in your head. You know, you start to like kind of translate in your head. And that's how it becomes really comfortable. But like most of us, we were raised on a standard Western diet. I was, you know, with meat in the center of the plate, a little bit of vegetable that was never really that good. And a little bit of starch or something that was okay. And that's what we're used to seeing. And now we just have to reinvent the plate or the bowl and think about it in a different way. It's just learning a new language, looking at things a little differently. It's quite exciting. And if you think about it as a real positive, fun adventure of, ooh, what could I try now? It can be a really positive, wonderful, transformative experience. So this may be a vegan diet. These foods are all technically vegan uh, and they're all animal free, but these are not health promoting foods. The future for veganism looks more like something like, not exactly, but plants, whole plants. And, you know, it's amazing what we could do with a diet of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. But this is such a different day and age. So it's like anything you could eat, you could find vegan now, anything, you cookies, candies, burgers, everything, you could shakes, there's everything out there, candies, everything you could possibly get, nuggets, <laughs> there's just everything now vegan, which is fabulous. I love it because people are more willing to transition to eating this way if they see something super familiar and they can kind of transition using those foods. And it's great if you want to treat food, you know, there's nothing better. Now there's vegan restaurants everywhere. I can't believe the little remote places I found vegan options around the world. So it's like never before has it been this easy to eat vegan. However, I'm a little concerned about people that see these new products as staple foods. And the reason for that is for the first time in my career, and I've been teaching plant-based nutrition for almost 17 years. I go based on my daughter. She's maybe 17 this summer. I can't believe it. That's crazy. But anyway, she, I started right when she was born. And now in the last, I want to say five years since these products have become so ubiquitous, I am seeing people come to me, vegans who are coming to me with the same health issues as I see with the omnivorous clients, you know? People are coming to me with high blood pressure and excess weight that they can't lose, or they're gaining weight or high cholesterol, things that I never saw before with someone that was on a plant-based diet. So that's a concern of mine. And uh, the bigger picture of that is 
a lot of people come to this way of eating for the health reasons, you know, because of all these incredible advantages of the health, of the health benefits of eating this way. And if the literature starts to show no difference between a vegan diet and an omnivorous diet, when they come, kind of, usually it's stratified and they're comparing people on a vegan diet to a vegetarian diet, to a pescatarian diet, to an omnivorous diet. Usually that's how it looks like in the literature. If you start to see them kind of blur, kind of like what happened with cholesterol and statins, it's not going to be as exciting for people. They're not going to be like, oh, well, I should eat this way because it'll be super healthy. So I'm a little concerned about that. And I hope one of my messages is to make those foods that are, you know, the, the hyper palatable foods, the ones that are on the marketplace that are filled with oils and sugars and all those things and flowers and all that stuff. We'll talk about that later is to make those treats and infrequent and rather, you know, spend a day of deliciousness, enjoying something like that, going to a special restaurant, having a treat meal like that, rather than making those your staple foods. So I love this list because this is how to just simplify what you can eat. I want you to eat a diet based on vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices in infinite tasty combinations. There are so many ways to make this delicious. You know, you could take a bowl of rice and beans. I have a video where I showed this. You can make all sorts of different versions of just rice and beans. So I just got back from Mexico visiting my parents and we had lots of rice and beans with cilantro and salsa and guacamole and all sorts of deliciousness in that same bowl of rice and beans. But you could take another rice and beans and you can make it curry style. You know, I spent time in Thailand and I would eat black rice and bean and lentils and legumes and we would turn it into with all these Thai flavors. And you could go anywhere in the world and you could have a completely different palette. So essentially there is something for everyone. There are infinite ways to enjoy these delicious, staple health promoting foods, which we're going to dive into, of course. So what does this look like? This is a, an example. I don't want anyone to go, oh my gosh, I have to eat exactly this every single day and be perfect three times a day. There is no perfect and I always ask everyone to remember that perfection can be the root of the, you know, the, the inhibition of progress. And we've all heard that before. But if you go in this going, I'm going to try to eat like this, I'm going to try to get these foods, I'm going to try to just explore with this. That's fine. If you, you don't have to eat 100% RDI or DRI, the, the daily recommended foods every single day, I don't think that's even possible especially with our current crisis of overnutrition, which is very consuming around the world. We just need to focus on like an idea. This is just a sketch and an outline of what to think about your plate. Like I said, we're trying to redefine the plate. This is an example. This was my plant-based nutrition plate. Also, you can find this in my books and on my website if you want to look at it and have the numbers and all that. But everyone agrees. I mean, everyone except for the fed diet groups out there. Everyone agrees that half your plate should come from fruits and vegetables. This is USDA, Harvard. This is the American Institute of Cancer Research. Vegetables and fruits, half your plate, half your day, lots of color. And we'll talk about all the incredible benefits of these foods soon. Another little, and you can see leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables have their own little category because those are extraordinary. We'll talk about that in the next slide or two, but um, th those should be a part of your staple diet, probably one of the most important ones. And then there's legumes. So you want to have about one to one and a half cups. It's about two to three servings a day of any, any kind of beans, lentils, peas, hummus should be a food group or soy foods like tofu and tempeh count in this category as well. This is where you get a lot of your essential amino acids and all sorts of fiber. We'll talk more about that later, but about a quarter of your plate from legumes. Then you'll see, I put a little section for mushrooms. I added those recently just because of their extraordinary health benefits, which we'll talk about on the next slide also. So try to incorporate those on a weekly basis, not necessarily have to be every single day. Again, not this doesn't have to be perfect by any means. And then fats, I recommend fats come from whole food sources. So nuts, seeds, avocados, and you know, I don't recommend oils. That's because oil is pure fat. Basically you take the almond or you take the olive or you take whatever it is and you extract all of the fat, it's pure fat. You're taking out all that health promoting fiber and most of the nutrition, almost all the oils are much less nutritious than the, the original um, food. And you're ending up with 
2000 calories a cup of oil. All oils are about 2000 calories a cup. Now you may say that's a lot who has a cup of oil, but if you think about it over the course of a day, you know, you pour some oil over your salad, you pour it into a pan and you make up a stir fry. It adds up really quickly. And 2000 calories is more than some people need in an entire day. So I don't recommend oils for the majority of population. Most people come to me for weight loss and most people come to me because they have high cholesterol. And in those cases, especially I have them completely avoid oil. My recipes don't have oil. It's so easy to cook and bake without any oil. It's just become super easy. You just have to kind of think about it. Think outside of of what you're used to. Again, it's just a little bit different, but um, these, this is where we recommend you get your fats. And so I recommend one to two ounces or 30 to 40 grams of nuts and seeds a day. That's because, well, we'll talk about that in the next slide, but that's where the preponderance of evidence shows all of the cardiometabolic and actually weight loss benefits. There's a lot of benefits to consuming uh, a little bit of nuts and seeds every day. And then whole grains has a category down there. Whole grains are super healthy. Diets have been founded upon whole grains for centuries, millennia, since the beginning of time. They are staples. They are accessible. They are low in cost. They are culinarily diverse. They add to all the diversity. You can make all sorts of deliciousness with whole grains and they are great for satiety. So they're wonderful foods and there's so many. So there's a lot of gluten-free ones. If you're considering gluten-free, like all of the rices, I love black forbidden rice or purple rice. There's wild rice brown rice. There's other things besides rice. I think there's 40,000 varieties of rice I've read that are edible. There's barley, oats, there's um, whole wheat if you're not gluten-free, but there's also things like amaranth and quinoa and millet and all sorts of deliciousness. And if you want, you can sprout them and get a little bit extra nutrition from them, but um, it's a wonderful thing to include in your diet. So I use this mnemonic called the six daily threes. And again, this image is on my website if you want to look at it more carefully later. And it's basically a way to prioritize those foods. So in that big list, vegetables, fruits, grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, herbs, and spices, I'm hoping you'll say that together with me at the end of this. Um, what do we prioritize? <clears throat> and these are six, well, five, I'll talk about that, groups that are unique nutritionally, super unique. Like they have things that you can't get elsewhere. And so I would suggest prioritizing this on a daily basis as much as you can. Again, nothing has to be perfect. It's just something to think about when you're designing what you're gonna eat in a day, when you're meal planning, when you're batch cooking or prepping or thinking about the week ahead. These are the foods to consider prioritizing. So I wanna dig deep into these because there's so, there's so many good nuggets about all of them. So I wanna talk about that for a second. So those cruciferous leafy greens and cruciferous, I've, I've updated this slide, but I have to, it's not here. It's on my website, but I'll talk about it. I've lumped leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables together. They are, well, cause a lot of them overlap. They are so extraordinary. And if you have to choose, they're probably the most health promoting food group. They offer the most nutritional bang for your caloric buck. In the crucifera, crucifera category, this includes things like broccoli and, and uh, Brussels sprouts and cauliflower and kale and collards and bok choy and even watercress and wasabi and daikon, those things count as well. Even arugula is count as a cruciferae. And in the leafy category, it's most of those, but also things like lettuce. Lettuce is really nutritious. People throw garnish, but lettuce is really actually healthy. Even like romaine and the, the lighter lettuces, really healthy. Beet greens, also spinach, fresh herbs count as leafy greens as well. Altogether, these categories contain a ton of fiber. Of course, all plants have fiber. In fact, plants are the only source of fiber. You can't get fiber outside of plants. They are the OG source of fiber. These leafy greens and cruciferous are also very high in folate, foliage, folate, really, really healthy. Vitamin C, E, and K1, philoquinone, a really important nutrient for our blood and all sorts of other things. You also get all of these minerals in the leafy greens like calcium, which is really important for bone health and for healthy aging because fragility becomes a problem for us as we age. It's what leads to more tar increased mortality. It's also high in iron and potassium and phosphorus and zinc and a lot of phytonutrients like the green, the green itself is chlorophyll. So that green chlorophyll is, I know everyone likes to use the word detoxifying, but it really is kind of like detoxifying and alkalizing and all sorts of wonderful things. In fact, when I was in Mexico at the spa, they gave me this chlorophyll filled water and it was really kind of pretty and neat that they're just, they're extracting it, but you can get it directly from the plants. You don't have to have any supplements from that. 
but it's a great reason to get more green. I always say I put my leafy green goggles on. I'm always looking for those greens. And they also have this pro vitamin A carotenoids underneath. So the green is so dominant, that chlorophyll is so dominant that it covers up all the red, orange, and yellow pigments that are underneath, but it still has all the benefits. It has flavonoids and anthocyanins and phytosterols and so much more. So these, these compounds collectively protect against cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, obesity, diabetes, so much more. That's because they are potent antioxidants very anti-inflammatory. They have this one interesting compound called sulforaphane. Many of you have heard of this. When you chop up cruciferous vegetables, that sulforaphane starts to take place because of this enzyme called morosinase. And it converts these into this very active um, and uh, cancer fighting compound called isothiocyanates. And so it's good to chop them or chew them before you cook them. Well, you don't want to chew them and then cook them, but chop them and then before let them sit for a little bit for that enzymatic reaction to take place. Similar with the allium family, the, the um, onions and garlic and stuff, you want to chop them and let that allianase take place. So that enzyme happens too, because then you're getting this added benefit before you're cooking them. One more little of note with respect to leafy greens. Some of the leafy greens, especially things like um, uh, it's spinach, a lot of people go, oh, I'm going to eat my spinach every day because that's the leafy green of choice. And I would say to diversify your greens because things like spinach and shard and beet greens have these compounds called oxalates. And you don't want to have too much of your leafy greens coming from those because they are linked to some a higher risk for stones, but also it may inhibit some of the absorption of one of those wonderful minerals like calcium and iron that are that live in those leafy greens. So diversify your greens, include them every day, the cruciferous and the leafy greens. One serving is about one cup raw or half a cup cooked. Enjoy them. Like when I, as soon as we hang up, I'm going to eat a huge salad with lots of leafy greens and I'm eating, I have it already because I, I plan my meals. I'm going to eat my fiesta cauliflower rice that has some cooked greens in there and um, some cauliflower rice so that a rice cauliflower. So I'm getting lots of cruciferous and that's going to be the basis of my lunch. I can't wait to eat that. <laughs> but first let's talk about the other colored vegetables. They had their own category as well because the reds and oranges and yellows and the whites like the allium family and the, the cauliflower and all of that have other unique nutritional properties. So the red, orange, and yellow, such as when you look at bell peppers or sweet potatoes or squash, they have these powerful things called carotenoids, which are powerful pro-vitamin precursors. And this is really important for development and growth and immune function, vision. That's why they say eat your carrots for your eyes. Really important also cooked, cooked uh, vitamin A, like in a, in a, like a lycopene and lutein in a, like a marinara sauce or a sofrito, which is like a, a red sauce that cooks all day, traditional in the Mediterranean diet that has been shown to be associated with reduced risk for prostate cancer. So really, really important, powerful antioxidants. And then the white vegetables, like in the allium family, super healthy organosulfur compounds and polyphenols or anti-hypertensive, anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic. So reducing your risk for a thrombi in your bloodstream, really important to avoid strokes and stuff like that. And also some anti-cancer properties. So you want to consider eating these every day. Uh, also the blue, purple, and deep red shades like eggplant and cabbage, beets, purple potatoes, purple corn. These things have that dominant blue purple color are from anthocyanins, which again are associated with attenuating obesity and uh, inflammation and all of those things, helping improve gut microbiome. Super important. The, the gut microbiome is extraordinarily important. I'm sure you've heard about this. The research I feel like is at the tip of the iceberg of what we're uncovering with how powerful those bacteria that live in your gut are. I've heard the numbers have switched a little, but I've heard that it's about 10 times the amount of bacteria than, that our bodies are made of versus our own cells. So we are more bacteria than we are human, which is a weird thought, but you want happy bacteria. You want a happy microbiome and you get that by eating fiber and prebiotics and all of these nutrition nutritious vegetables and fruits that feed the healthy bacteria, which will then get rid of the unhealthy bacteria and will help support your immune function, your cardiovascular function. Basically, we're finding out all this information about the, the microbiome that's really super important across the board. 
Then there's a category of fruits. So fruits is about one serving would be about one medium piece or one cup. And of course, there's a wide variety of fruits. Berries are incredibly nutritious. All of the blueberries and blackberries and raspberries and strawberries and cranberries and currants, all of those, they're um, really antioxidant rich as well. They've got all these bioactive compounds and tannins and vitamin C, and they act again as anti-inflammatory and reduce your risk for chronic disease. Then there's the citrus fruits like grapefruits, lemons, limes, oranges, and those have their, um, the bitter taste, but they're really good for their vitamin C and the fiber and B vitamins as well. Then there's stone fruits like apricots and cherries coming into season soon, peaches, nectarines, and plums. And um, these also have anthocyanins depending on their colors, but other phenolic compounds. And then there's the tropical fruits, which happen to be my favorite, pineapples and papaya and uh, bananas are included in this category, jackfruit, mangosteen, durian, for those of you that like durian, I'm not one of those fans, but there's all sorts of wonderful tropical exotic fruits that offer unique properties as well. And they add so much diversity to your diet. Uh, then there's the palms or the tree fruits like apples and pears, this, the staple fruits, if you will. They're usually available most of the year. I'm a little spoiled because I live in Los Angeles and we have access to a lot of fresh produce throughout the year, but um, I know it's not the case everywhere. But then there's melons as well. So melons are another world of um, fruits that you can incorporate into your diet. And then there's those nuts and seeds again. So I just want to dig in a little bit on why nuts and seeds are unique, nutritionally speaking. They are unique sources of different types of fiber. They have some wonderful amino acids. Everyone's always chasing protein, which we don't need to do on a plant-based diet, but you get them well, well, a lot of the amino acids, especially in nuts and seeds and legumes, which we'll talk about next. But they also are high in vitamin E and K and folate. And all of those minerals like calcium and copper and iron and magnesium and zinc, which is important. Certain nuts like Brazil nuts are high in, in um, uh, selenium, which is an important mineral as well. Certain things like uh, flax seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds happen to be high and walnuts happen to be high in omega-3 fatty acids, which we'll talk about a little later. And um, there's also things like lignans and elagic acid that are unique to nuts and seeds. So that's why I incorporate them as a, a unique category that should be consumed every day. So again, the literature seems to end up on one to two ounces or 30 to 40 grams a day. It's about quarter cup or half cup. For those of you, and I have a lot of clients that are trying to lose weight or have problems like you know, not overeating nuts and seeds are so easy to overeat, especially now that you don't have to actually crack a shell. They're just in bags where you can just grab them. That can be risky for some people that have that tendency. So what I have my clients do and a delicious way to incorporate them is to blend them up into a dress or a dressing or a sauce and make, that's what I have over there. I've got a ranch dressing base with, I have a mix of nuts and seeds in there as the base. And that's going to help you absorb the fat soluble nutrients in the, the vegetables that you're eating it over. And it will help you avoid overeating them. So you could just measure them out and then put them away. Some people that can't even have them at home. I have them just kind of crush them up and then stick them in the freezer. So it's, it's not as exciting to take a spoon and eat them hand to mouth, but they are so important to incorporate. So even if you tend to have that issue, get them raw and, and, and measure them out. And they're really important as part of a healthy diet. And then back to those lovely legumes. So one serving is about half a cup, uh, give or take. It depends on what you're actually eating, but um, try to get two to three servings of those a day. And the six daily threes means three servings of these six things. Legumes are incredible. So they are great for, again, those essential amino acids and so many fibers, including some resistant starch, which is a really healthy category of fibers as well. And uh, they have soluble and insoluble, all sorts of different fibers. They're really high. Again, this is a really great place to get your iron and your calcium and your zinc and your magnesium and a lot of B vitamins, including that folate. Again, they also have a lot of phytonutrients, especially if you're looking at the soy foods, they're high in those isoflavones, which have been very heavily studied and have been associated with reduced risk for cardiovascular disease and uh, breast cancer and breast cancer mortality, all sorts of things that are really important in, in those soy foods. Mushrooms are not here, but I've updated my six daily threes. I will talk about that first, and then I'll talk about the movement exercise category. But really, the it seems to be like three servings of three different types of species of mushrooms in a week is a fair kind of thing to look for. I added them into the six daily threes and into my plate because they are so important. I used to lump them in with vegetables, and I realized it was put to my attention that mushrooms are not vegetables. They are, in fact, fungi. 
and I was calling it fungi. It's fungi. I just learned this when I interviewed Paul Stamas last year. So yes, uh, they are super, super important and they have all sorts of kind of unique things that are extraordinary for our health, like these glucans and have my cells, celluloses and all the calcium and iron, all those minerals as well. And they are really just a wonderful source of these cytoprotective things like uh, this, this amino acid called ergothionine. And uh, so they're wonderful. They are very antimicrobial. They are really protective of your immune system. And because immunity is, well, everything, especially now, uh, I really recommend including legumes. Now, a lot of, I'm sorry, uh, mushrooms. If you don't love mushrooms, uh, there's a little hack. I know a lot of people have a, an issue with the texture. I mean, you could do all sorts of things and there's so many different types of mushrooms. Like you could do a, a mushroom portobello burger, or you could cut them up really, really fine and make it minced and make it like a kind of a ground meat out of it and use it like that. But some people that really have this aversity to the texture, I, I see this all the time. I hear this all the time. Um, there's things like, like what I'm drinking right now, I have a tea. It's like a green hibiscus tea, but it has mushrooms in it. You can't taste it. But if you really have a problem with that, and then there's supplements, if you really can't tolerate it, but they're really important to incorporate. Originally I had movement as the last sixth daily three. And that's because movement on a regular basis is really important. So stand instead of sit, you know, move, walk, use your, use a, um, a step counter, just you want to be active. It doesn't have to be a workout per se. I just touched my watch and it just gave me some feedback, <laughs> but you just want to be active every day. You want to just get out there, move your body, do things that are, you know, stretch and, you know, and strengthening and cardiovascular, there's all sorts of things to incorporate, but you know, about 20 minutes, three times a day is a great thing to think about as a serving of exercise, but ultimately you just want to be more active. That's important. Okay. So let's talk about meal planning. What does this really look like? We're talking about all these different nutrition and foods and all that, but what does it really sound like? So I'm going to read my list of just some of the foods you can make with all these ingredients. Pots, pans, plates, power bowls, soups, salad, sides, sweets, stews, stir fry, stacks, scrambles, skewers, sushi, sauces, sautés, sheet pans, slaws, steaks, stuffed veggies, chilies, chowders, casseroles, curries, lasagna, loaded potatoes, loaves, pastas, panini, paellas, pancakes, pilas, pizza, polento, pestos, puddings, pot stickers, purees, bisque steaks, Barbecue, biryani, burritos, burgers, hummus, dips, dressings, wraps, rolls, ramen, risottos, roast tacos, tostadas, toast, tofu, tempeh, trail mix, tarts, tagine, dumplings, fajitas, masalas, kebabs, quiches, wings, ratatouille, and so much more. I'd love to hear what you want to add to that list, but there is no, no uh, lack when it comes to eating a plant-based diet. The two things I hear, the two concerns or obstacles for a lot of people to transition this way is that it's so difficult or that it's so expensive. So I want to spend a little minute just kind of debunking that. Any diet, no matter what you are eating, has a wide, broad spectrum of simplicity and complexity, as well as affordability and more gourmet, expensive, fancy eating out type of a thing. And in terms of ease and how to prepare, it could be super, super simple and it could be super gourmet and, and more challenging, you know, with more advanced techniques, if you will. But there's a very, very broad diversity of gray area in between that. And so I like to think about it like this on an omnivorous diet, right? You can't eat on the very simple side, like you could have a PB and J, or you could have a tuna fish sandwich, or just an omelet, right? Or eggs, right? Fried eggs and whatever you make at home. That's really super simple and really affordable and easy. Um, but then you could also go out and you could do really affordable, and you can go to the dollar menu at the fast food restaurant and get, you know, a whole meal, a, a beef burrito, or a or a burger and fries on a really on a dollar menu. It's so it's really simple or cheap. But you could also go out and you could have a lobster dinner or a filet mignon, or you can make that at home. There's so much you could do on an omnivorous diet, but then let's like flip that and look at that from a plant-based perspective. So at home, you can make a very simple rice and beans dish for very affordable. You could throw frozen rice into the microwave and open up a can of beans for really, really cheap and really, really delicious and pour over some salsa or some hot sauce and have a full meal just like that. Frozen vegetables, all that super simple. But you could also get a little bit more exotic. You can cook from home and make like a, a truffled ravioli or, you know, with a cashew cream sauce or a portobello wellington, mushroom wellington, 
or you can go out to a vegan restaurant. There are so many vegan restaurants, like I said, all over the world that have all sorts of more gourmet and more expensive um, foods that you could buy. So there is no, you know, it doesn't matter if you're omnivorous or if you're a vegetarian, or if you're on a plant-based diet, you can eat this way very simply and very affordably. And ironically, maybe the simpler foods tend to be the healthier foods. People call them the simple staples. I like to call them simple staples. They've been known as quote unquote peasant foods, like those real basic foods, like, you know, beans and rice again, or soup, just like the stone soup, you know, really simple ingredients that tends to be the healthiest anyways. So that's a good way to think about it, that it doesn't have to be difficult and it doesn't have to be expensive. And it can, if you want to branch out and learn some new skills and get more creative in the kitchen, you absolutely can. There's so many options and everything in between. Often I'm asked about how do you keep your kitchen stock? So I wanted to talk about that a little bit today because it's, you know, preparation is really key. Uh, if you plan to fail, you fail to plan. That's a, a really good saying I love to use. I break it up into fresh, flavors and foundationals in terms of how you stock your kitchen. So the fresh foods are things you need to buy more frequently because they don't last very long in your kitchen. Like your vegetables, the bulbs, the cruciferous veggies, of course, the leafy greens, and then like potatoes, the underground storage organs, sprouts don't tend to last very long. Mushrooms don't tend to last very long and fruits don't tend to last very long. So those are things that you probably need to buy more frequently, maybe once or maybe twice in a week. Um, but you could time these trips based on what you're going to make. So if you really plan that, you, I'm a big fan of lists. I think lists are extraordinarily helpful. So if you know, I'm going to make these three recipes in the next few days, you just write your shopping list, you go to the store and you could just kind of time it. And then, um, and then there's a category of flavors. So this is kind of a broad uh, category of sauces and seasonings that you could buy as needed. So I keep a list when I run out of things, I run to, I have a list on my notes on my phone. And I will just add it to my list when I, when I run out or I'm getting low on something, especially the things I use most often. But what I always have in my kitchen, almost always, are sauces like a marinara sauce, an oil-free marinara sauce. I always have an abundance of salsas, hot sauce. I have a whole cabinet filled with hot sauce. I actually posted a video sharing my plethora of so hot sauces that I have because I love to use hot sauce. Barbecue sauce, if you use that, all those different mustards and mustard sauces, ketchup. You could make all of your own, by the way, if you like. Sometimes are super easy um, and they're definitely, you can control the ingredients. You can make them very low in sodium and low in oil if you make them yourself, but you don't have to. These things are widely available now. Vinegars, there's an array of vinegars I always have in my cabinets. I love balsamic vinegar, rice vinegar, apple cider vinegar, red wine vinegar, white vinegar. There's so many different delicious vinegars and flavored vinegars that are magical. Like you could just throw those over a salad. If you're in a rush, and you don't have time to make your nut based or sea based dressing. Those are wonderful. And then there's a tamari or I like to use coconut aminos. I'm always looking for the lowest sodium versions. So I, I my kids tend to like the, the coconut aminos as well. Um, but there's so many different types as well that you can get to have. I use those as my salt or that or miso. That's what I tend to use in my recipes. Then there's spices and spice blends. Cause again, you could change the flavor of anything using a variety of spices. So if you, you want to, you know, venture out and try something you haven't tried before, you find a recipe that's a little unique. Like I've been experimenting more with African spices, like a Burberry. And I had some delicious Ethiopian cuisine when I was recently in DC and I learned about some new spices there. But once you learn about cooking that, you buy that seasoning. You can get anything online now if you can't find it at your local grocer. I go to a lot of local um, uh, grocers. Like I have a Mexican grocer near me. I have a Persian market that I go to uh, just to get some more of the, the more um, specific cuisine oriented ones. But then once you bring that spice home, then you could experiment with it. And it lasts at least a year. So it's kind of fun. You can collect all those different um, things and, and enjoy them in different ways. And then I always tend to have olives and pickles and sauerkraut and can, uh, jarred jalapenos to use uh, at the ready for different recipes. I always have jarred minced ginger and garlic in my fridge um, I, or on my shelf if I haven't opened it yet. And then the stuff I use for sweeteners, I don't use straight up sugar. I usually use in my recipes, maple syrup or date syrup or date paste. So I have those stocked in my kitchen at all times. Blackstrap molasses, those are really shelf stable until you open them, those are great too. And then the staples or foundationals, which are also things you could buy as needed. And I always have stocked in my, in my kitchen. I always have legumes, dried legumes, like peas and lentils and beans. And then of course, in the refrigerator, I always have tofu and tempeh ready to go. You could also get the um, aseptic tofus that are um, in those packages. And you could use those, have those on your, um, in, stored in your pantry for a lot longer. 
Then canned legumes. I'm a big fan of the salt-free beans and a BPA free canned beans. I always have those always. I use those all the time for, for hummus, multiple hummuses, however you would say it. And, um, I put them in my cells. I use beans and everything. Cause again, legumes are one of the six daily threes. I always have dried whole grains and my in my pantry, I've got amaranth and barley and oats. I millet, quinoa, rice, the stuff we talked about earlier, raw nuts and seeds. I always have a wide array. I actually have a most, you can't see them from here. I don't know. Maybe you can see them They're over there. I've got today, I've got pistachios and cashews and Brazil nuts and almonds and sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds. And I just throw them in my blender and make up a dressing. And they're always right there on my counter. Uh, and then I keep chia flax and hemp seeds in my fridge. It's good to keep your nuts and seeds in the fridge and freezer, actually, if you're not going to use them quickly, because they, because of the high fat, they will, you know, get rancid a little quicker. So that's important to consider, but having a wide variety is really important and uh, have them ready to go. I always have canned or jarred things like corn or water chestnuts or artichoke hearts. I use a lot of roasted red peppers in water in a jar, just because I could throw those in a really delicious dressing or sauce. They make vibrant orangey color that are delicious. I use a lot of that in my recipes as well. I always have an array of tomato products on my kitchen, like canned or jarred tomato paste. I look for the sodium free. I have all sorts of tomatoes. I like the, um, also so low sodium or sodium free, either crushed or chopped all those different types are whole, depending on the recipe you're going to make tomato sauce. And I always have dry sun-dried tomatoes, the ones in the bag without the oil. Uh, those are really delicious. I have those in my cellar that I'm going to have for lunch. Dried fruits. If you eat dried fruits, you know, including the tomatoes or dates, dates is a great sweetener. Dates are a great sweetener to use in recipes as well. And, uh, or date piece and date syrup, like I said before, and then shelf stable plant milks, or I have just, I have fresh plant milk in my fridge. I I'm really into the cashew milk. Now in terms of plant milks, I recommend the unsweetened always. And then you could do flavor depending on what you're going to use it for, but because I don't really use it as a uh, food, I use it more of as ingredient. I don't really drink plant milk ever. Sometimes I'll put it in my coffee or tea, but I also use it as a, a, an ingredient in sauces and dressings. So I, I'm really big into this cashew milk that's unsweetened and plain, but there's so many milks now. I just don't recommend ca uh, coconut milk. That's the one I would use as a, a treat when you're making a special curry or something like that. But the coconut is high in um, saturated fat. And then in my freezer, I always have frozen vegetables and fruits. And yes, they are wonderful. They're not less nutritious. In fact, sometimes they're even more nutritious than the fresh, because if you think about it from its time, it's harvested. If it's flash frozen, you know, you're going to retain the nutrients longer than if it's harvested, put on a truck, driven to a market, sitting on the shelf, waiting for you to pick it up. You pick it up, you take it home, you store it in your kitchen for a while, then you finally eat it. There's a long period of time because as soon as it's harvested, the nutrients start to slowly degrade. Uh, of course, it's just not getting its nutrients from the soil anymore. So frozen is a great option. Not only that, they're so convenient. Like I, when I travel a lot, I used to travel a lot more than now, but when I travel a lot or anyone that travels, it's nice to come home and just, if you don't have time to go to the store the next day or you're working right away, you could just, you know, throw out some frozen vegetables and make a, a healthy meal and have your fruits and vegetables. Cause again, half your plate should come from fruits and vegetables. It just makes it super convenient. I have frozen mushrooms. I have frozen pre-cooked rice or quinoa in there. I have frozen oats sometimes. Uh, sometimes I'll have some frozen sorbet or stuff like that for my kids when they visit. There's so many things you can stick in your freezer and they stay for a long period of time. So that's the way I think about uh, how to stock your kitchen. And then same thing in terms of shopping. There are three ways to think about shopping. There is, you know, budget shopping, there's convenient shopping, and there's a more ambitious shopping. So let's start with budget. So if you're really on a budget, which is really easy to do on a plant-based site, here are some tips for eating on a budget, shopping on a budget. Go to those big box stores for those things that you're going to eat, like Costco or Sam's Club or Walmart or Smart and Final. And stock up on the shelf staple items like the beans or whole grains or potatoes. You can get a huge bag of potatoes for really inexpensive. Also the convenience foods. I love to get at Costco or one of those stores, uh, bag salads, because it's so much cheaper, like the slaws that I could just throw in a bowl. That's part of my salad over there. Um, you can just throw them in a bowl. The frozen veggies and frozen fruits, you can get these huge bags for a lot more cost effective at the box store. So that's a great thing too. You can stop up on the, dr the dried legumes and grains and nuts and seeds at these stores as well. Just keep them in the freezer, the nuts and seeds after you open them. 
Then you can go to the farmer's markets. And sometimes if you go at the end of the day, you can get the better deals. That's a great way to get produce uh, more affordably. Uh, don't worry about organic if you're on a budget. Again, it's more important to eat the, the vegetables and fruits than it is to have them organic. It's better if it's organic if you can, but the benefits, all the benefits we see with eating fruits and vegetables have been studied specifically for just vegetables and fruits, not necessarily organic. So that's really important. Another way to help save money is to not shop hungry. How many of you have done that? You go to the store, you're hungry, and suddenly everything sounds good. And oh, I'm just going to try a little this, a little that. It's so easy to get tempted. So it's better to go full and stick to your list. I'm a big list lover. And so put your list there and stick to your list. Like tell yourself, you're only going to stay on your list. That will help you stay on a budget as well. Other ways to buy uh, on a budget is to go online. You know, there's all these wonderful websites now where you can get foods for even more affordably or look for the sales. There's a lot of sales. Like I love um, uh, vitacost.com is one example where you can get things on sale, where you get a discount if you buy a certain amount. That's another way to save money. Now, some people are shopping with convenience as a primary goal. And a lot of clients I work with are looking for convenience because they just, they work full time, their parents, they're just trying to like get healthy food on the table fast, totally respectable goal. I mean, I can relate to that. And um, so I help my clients do that with things like convenience thinking, like again, frozen foods, the, the salads that are already chopped, like vegetables that are already chopped, you may pay a little bit more for the pre-chopped things, but that's worth it if you're trying to eat healthy for some people, totally wonderful. Salad bars for convenience, if you're eating out for lunch or you're trying to find a healthy meal on the go, if you're traveling, salad bars can be wonderful. I'm so glad they're finally back. I miss those over all this pandemic. It's been so nice to see the, the salad bars come back. Oh, I'm seeing them more and more. So those are wonderful for convenience as well. Again, the canned beans, if you can't make your beans, which it's great to make them, but again, for convenience, canned is fine. Just look for the sodium free jarred things. Those are really great too. And then the more ambitious category means more like, you know, if you want to go to those more specific types of stores, like I mentioned before, or if you want to go to like a whole foods or more of an expensive type of place, but you're going to get a lot of the collection of those healthy foods and a lot of those vegan products that you're looking for. You're going to find more at those markets. Also nowadays it's getting easier to find elsewhere. So that's just a way to think about it. And what do you have in the kitchen? People always ask me, how do you stock up the kitchen in terms of appliances? It doesn't have to be complicated. Usually the things I use the most, I use a very simple blender, a little small little blender for my dressings and sauces. I live alone now. So I just make one little, my dressings and sauces and a little one person use, and I use it over two days. Uh, and that's what I use, but sometimes I'll whip out my big blender at my, the, you know, what you're going to use to make a soup or you're going to use to make something more big, like, like a just bigger quantity. Uh, those would be one of those um, big blenders that you could have too. And then a chopping board and a good knife is really important, really helpful. And, uh, you know, an immersion blender is nice. If you're making a soup and you want to make it pureed, or if you want to make it in for hummus, uh, that's a great thing to have. I use my food processor when I'm making hummus. I love to make my own hummus. I sometimes use the electric pressure cooker or, or the um, slow cooker. I rarely use a lot of people love the slow cooker. That's something a lot of people have, but you don't need to have all these things. My favorite tool in my kitchen happens to be this, this oven. That's the, um, the, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name of it. It's my favorite. Did I write it down? <laughs> It's my favorite thing because it is, uh, it, I just, again, I, I cook for myself now. And so it's really nice to have this little oven. I don't have to have the whole big oven and I make, uh, everything. I bake everything in there. I bake my potatoes and all that. Oh, it's a Breville smart oven. It's an air fryer. It bakes, it toasts, it does everything. And so for, for one or two people in a house, or even if you're just trying to make something quick, it's a great tool to have, but you could have, you know, some pots and pans, having a good pot and pan is really helpful. Having a colander, measuring cups and spoons is important, especially if you're just learning how to cook or if you're just trying to make, you know, if you're just not used to how much something should be, I'm still, I always use my measuring cups and measuring spoons, um, large wooden spoons, a ladle, tongs, a whisk, baking sheets, oven mitts. Those are nice staples. And then if you want, you can have a citrus reamer or a citrus press. You can have a spiralizer, a spiral slicer, a mandolin. You can get more fancy and have like a milk frother if you want to make a do-it-yourself latte and save a lot of money from going out to the store and getting it. Um, those are just some of the things you could use. But the air fryers are very popular right now. You could do all sorts of fun things with an air fryer and a dehydrator if you like to do, uh, if you're on a raw diet or if you want to experiment with dehydrating things, that could be super fun. But really, if you have a knife and a cutting board and maybe a blender and definitely a potter pan, 
You can do anything plant-based. I used to have to use this slide. I've used this slide since that last book, since many books ago, but I don't have to say it anymore. But any recipe now, if you just want to take a standard recipe, you can swap things in and make and plantify them. So there's a wall of plant milks now. It's not just, it used to be rice milk or soy milk. And now it's soy milk, almond milk, cashew milk. The oat milk is really popular. Cashew milk is my favorite right now. And they all offer different things. So again, I like the unsweetened and I like to keep the unflavored, but um, they all offer different things nutritionally and culinarily speaking. Soy and cashew tend to be creamier. Almonds a little lighter. Rice is a little grainier. Hemp milk is a little grainier uh, and really nutritious because it's got all those omega-3 fats in there. Depends on what you're looking for. Depends on what you like. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be perfect. You're not drinking milk for the nutrition. If you are, you know, you can get one. Most of them are now fortified with B12 and calcium and D. So that's a good source to get the calcium and vitamin D like you would from milk um, without all the harmful effects of milk. Egg replacements. Oh my goodness. We used to make, you know, chia seed or flax seed. You uh, add it one part of the seed to three parts water, and it turns into very egg-like uh, substance that you could use in different recipes. It depends on the recipes. Uh, I bake with bananas or applesauce or other fruit purees or vegetable purees, like a pumpkin puree to replace the eggs. They, they kind of do all sorts of interesting things, culinarily speaking, but there's also so many egg replacements now. So I, you know, you can replace uh, all of them. There's so many different options now uh, for if you're making an omelet or a, um, if you're baking with it, there's so many different options now. Cheese, oh my goodness, there's so many cheeses out there. I tend to love like for, again, there's a lot of great things on the, on the marketplace for, uh, you know, the decadent versions, because a lot of them have coconut oil, a lot of them have some heavy saturated fat things in there. So you want to be careful of those, but use those as treat foods. But when I'm entertaining and I have like a big, I'm trying to experiment with those charcuterie boards. So I'll do like two different hummai, I'll do maybe a Miyoko's cheese in the middle and a lot of vegetables and, and guacamole. And so I will include that for my, cause most of my friends are and locally are not vegan necessarily. So I like to like lure them in with those products, but I'm a fan of what I'm going to have on my Fiesta cauliflower rice is a nacho cheese sauce that you blend up in the blender. It's so delicious made based on nuts and seeds with nutritional yeast, nooch, love the nooch and uh, some spices and they're delicious. They go so well on everything. They make everything so yummy. Those are fun to experiment with and super healthy. Great way to get in your your nuts and seeds for the day. And then if you're looking for a meaty texture in a recipe, you know, you can use tofu and tempeh, you could use mushrooms again. Miso gives that umami flavor. So do sun-dried tomatoes. That's a really important thing in a, a well-rounded palate. So that's something to consider as well. And I like to think of recipes, I like to nutrify recipes. So eat all the foods on a bed of greens or add them over greens or add them over salad. I always throw in greens on everything because I, I put out my green goggles and like for my kids when they were little or when I could cook for them, I always add broccoli to their pasta because they love po their pastatarians, my kids, uh, or casseroles or grain dish. It's always just try to think of how you could throw in the greens. You, it's great because it could be an afterthought, right? You cook up a huge soup or stew. And at the very end, you just throw the greens in and wilt them. It takes a minute. And then you've got all that nutritiousness added to that recipe. And it tastes, you know, you don't really notice them after a while, or you do, and you love them. Uh, using whole grains instead of refined grains is always beneficial because you want the intact whole grain with all that fiber. You could sprinkle nuts and seeds over dishes if, you, if you're not eating, using your nuts and seeds as a dressing or sauce. And another way to nutrify foods is to sprout them. Sprouting grains or legumes or nuts and seeds will make it so that those nutrients are more easily absorbed, like the, especially some of those minerals, it just helps with the absorption. So that's something to consider playing with too, or buying them sprouted themselves. Dining out and travel, I'll talk about briefly, unless anyone wants to ask me questions about them. But some of my best tips for traveling and dining out while plant-based is check ahead of time. We've got those wonderful apps like Happy Cow or Yelp. And you can look up where you find, you can look up vegan or vegetarian or plant-based, and it will show you wherever you are in the world, options near you. And it's always an option to go to a store, almost always an option to go to a store or a farmer's market and get the, the foods you want and, and eat whatever you want. But there's also restaurants that you can kind of find just by looking ahead of time. I love that there's so many options now. And wherever you go, sometimes the best restaurants are like, there's all these great vegan restaurants, especially here in LA, we have a lot of options. 
sometimes it's harder to get the healthier foods then. You can get all sorts of delicious, you know, decadent foods. But sometimes like if I go to a steakhouse, where was I? I, I went to a, a restaurant with my son yesterday and we just order side dishes. You just kind of put together the side dishes and they have like the best side dishes. And that's a great way to get some healthy, nutritious foods on the go. If you're traveling, you could bring a can opener and you could bring a food container so they can go to a market and just grab a salad that's easy and grab a can of beans and open the can. Or now they have those tetracycle packs of beans or bags of beans. You could just cut them open or rip them open and you have that. You can get some vinegar, or some salsa, and you have a healthy dish on the go. So that's easy. You can try to get a hotel room with a microwave. Most hotel rooms will give you a refrigerator so you could bring food with you. Depends on if you're traveling by plane or by car, because if you're traveling by car, you could pack a whole cooler full of food. You could bring baked pota or unbaked potatoes and microwave them. There are so many easy ways to eat on the go now that it doesn't have to be, you know, like you can't eat out and you can't eat when you're traveling. You could bring some of your favorite sauces or condiments and now have these little travel packs. I sometimes tend to travel with hot sauce. If you've seen me on a plane, I always have a hot sauce or chili flakes or something like that because I like spice on my food. But um, there are options everywhere now. So back to this plate. This is a example, an example of what you should think about overall in terms of a healthy food. But you can get all of your nutrition here with an incredible array of disease fighting and health promoting nutrients. And it's healthy because you're of what you're avoiding. It's what you're eating, all of this, and what you're avoiding by not having animal products and not having the refined and processed foods. And you're avoiding excessive saturated fat and excessive amino acids, excessive iron. You know, I, I spent the first 10 years of my career defending the nutrient adequacy of a plant-based diet, but I've come to look at the research on health span and longevity. And it seems like you're actually healthier on a plant-based diet, perhaps because of what is naturally limited in these foods, which is kind of a nice way to look at it, but you're getting all of this nutrition. What may be limited in a plant-based diet? Here are all the vitamins and minerals that we know that are essential. <clears throat> And here are the nutrients that we need to kind of pay extra attention to on a plant-based diet. No diet is perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect diet. So what do we need to pay attention to specifically on a plant-based diet, right? On, an, on a standard Western diet, it's very low. It may be high in protein, all those other things that people always tout the benefits and B12, but it's also low in folate and fiber and vitamin C. And those are really high risk situations as well. So if we are on a plant-based site, these are the things to be concerned, not concerned about, noted and, and pay attention to. So I'm going to talk about these specifically. Vitamin B12. There is no debate about B12. If you are on a plant-based diet or anyone over the age of 50, anyone, no matter what your diet needs to supplement with B12 to avoid potentially irreversible neurological impairment, the safest, most effective, most cost-effective and convenient way to do so is just to take a supplement. And because it's the pickiest vitamin with a um, really interesting absorption curve, I always call it very finicky vitamin. It's got this attitude problem because it absorbs in a weird way. This is super complicated. We don't have to get into it, but basically uh, this translates into, this is the optimal way to supplement. Either if you like to take more pills, you could do 50 micrograms twice a day, 150 micrograms once a day or 2000 or 2,500 micrograms once a week, if you just want to pop one pill and that's just due to its absorption uh, curve, but it's water soluble. So we don't really see toxicity in vitamin B12. It's very, very rare. If, if it happens at all, your body will excrete the excess. And that's important. You won't see B12 show up as low in your blood work per se, because it's got you know, this, this weird lag time. So it'll stay in your bloodstream for longer. So if you haven't been taking B12 and you've been either you're over 50 or you're on a vegan diet for a few years, you may not see it depleted in your bloodstream. So you need to be mindful of this. This is why we see like about 50 last, last I checked, it was about 50% of vegans having a B12 deficiency and it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. I've actually seen it happen in one client who refused to take her supplements and um, she got lucky because we caught it quickly enough. So be mindful of your B12. Vitamin D is more complex, however. 
Because first of all, it's a fat soluble nutrient and we make vitamin D naturally in our skin. When our skin is exposed to the sun, the UVB rays, our skin absorbs it and it converts it in the liver and kidneys into the active form. But because of a lot of different variables, like most of us are avoiding the sun because of risk for skin cancer. Many of us are not at a good latitude for sun absorption fog or smog. I live in Los Angeles. I live in the perfect latitude for sun absorption. And we have sun, I don't know, 380 days of the year. Today's not one of them, but most of the days of the year we have sun. And I still see so much uh, vitamin D deficiency here, just because of all those other things we put, we solder our skin with sunscreen, excess fat on the skin um, impairs absorption, the darker your skin, the more you need. So there's different variables that happen, but it's not something you want to blindly supplement like B12 because you want to know what your blood work looks like. So I have my clients test their vitamin D levels. So you're not supplementing blindly. You don't want to get, you can have excessive vitamin D a toxicity. So you don't want to do that as well. Um, you can, you know, a 2000 IU a day is okay for regular supplementing for most people, but again, please have your blood checked and, um, don't dose blindly. Sometimes you need to bring it, your levels up. Vitamin D is increasingly being seen as important for all sorts of things. Like even with our risk for COVID and our risk for, um, you know, all sorts of things, immune wise and uh, all sorts of things, our bone health, you need your vitamin D levels to be adequate to absorb the calcium that you take in, in your food. There's so many reasons to have optimal levels of vitamin D and so many people don't that it is worth investigating for yourself. Vitamin K, like I said before, you get plenty of vitamin K one from phylloquinone, all those gorgeous green vegetables. But there's an interesting kind of thing about vitamin K2. Now we need vitamin K for all sorts of vitamin K dependent proteins, such as those that are involved in clotting. When I was in grad school, we learned clotting and um, cardiovascular function. That's where K comes in, but also for bone health. And so it turns out that we need both forms of vitamin K, K1 philoquinone, and then K2, which is menaquinone, which is produced from a bacteria. So if you like that stuff in that picture um, called, uh, what's that called? Um, I don't like it. So I don't remember what it's called. There's one form of it. I have it written somewhere. That's so funny. I don't have it here. Um, what is that? Not natto. It's natto. Sorry. Natto. If you like natto and you can get natto, that's a source of K2, but we don't really get it on a plant-based diet. That's why uh, it is something to consider supplementing because K2 seems to really like, you know, your cardiovascular system is going to prioritize the K. And so then the bone health might suffer. So it's something to consider is supplementing with K2, but we don't really know for sure um, how necessary that is. So it's something to consider. And then the two minerals we need to be considered of on a plant-based diet include zinc and iodine. Zinc is, a, is an essential trace mineral. We need it for immune function. We've all heard it talked about a lot in the last two years because of our immunity. We do need zinc for that. We need it for a neurological function. We need it for growth when we're pregnant. Um, plant sources of zinc, like I mentioned before, are the nuts and seeds and legumes. But because those foods tend to have so much fiber and they have these things called phytates, it may mean that we are not absorbing as much zinc as we need to. So you can either eat more of those foods or consider supplementing. And iodine is interesting. We need iodine for our thyroid hormones and our metabolism and neurological function. And we need about 150 micrograms a day as an adult. But what's interesting is that a lot of people are cutting out salt because of their high blood pressure or because they're salt sensitive or interestingly, they're using these fancy salts. We were asked about that on the panel last night. People are using Himalayan pink salt or black lava salt and all those. Those are not iodized. And that's why we iodized salts many years ago was because of this iodine deficiency that we see. We're seeing, I'm seeing a little bit more goiters take place lately because I think this is the reason. So iodine is really important to be mindful of. You can get it from iodized salt. You can get it from sea vegetables, although the dosing tends to be kind of like all over the place with that. So read the labels carefully, or you can consider supplementing as well. By the way, those five micronutrients, vitamin B12, D, K2, iodine, and zinc can be found. You can get it in a multivitamin. I have most of my clients just supplement. I supplement with a multivitamin that has all of those things in just the right dose is not too much. Uh, and just all of those things can be easily just, you don't have to think about it after that. You just can take a supplement or you could look at it piece by piece. The one macronutrient that we talk about as potentially being low in vegans. And when you look at the blood of vegans, we do have lower levels of the long chain omega-3 fats, EPA, a acid. 
and DHA, the longer form docosahexaenoic acid. So when we take it in from alpha linolenic acid, ALA, from walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, soy foods have all the, the ALA in there, we need to elongate it into EPA and then DHA. But because we have lower levels of that at, on a vegan diet, we don't know if that's important because vegans seem to obviously have a lower incidence um, and prevalence of cardiovascular disease possibly Alzheimer's and things that are associated with this nutrients. We don't know if it's necessarily necessary. So I tend to go with the recommendation of take an EPA DHA microalgae formula a few times a week, just in case we don't really necessarily know that um, conclusively yet. So remember plan, practice, persist. This is all you really need to think about on a plant-based diet, keeping it super simple, eating a diet of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices in infinite tasty combinations, prioritizing the six daily threes and, you know, being not notable about those nutrients, those specific nutrients. But Aristotle insisted that virtues are formed in man by his doing the actions. And Will Durant, the famous historian, reflected on these writings and said that Excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have those because we have acted rightly. We are what we repeatedly do. So excellence then is not an act, but a habit. For us to be successful with a whole food plant-based diet, we just need to plan, practice, and persist. Until the new lifestyle is equally convenient, familiar, and enjoyable, we don't really have to choice. One of these three things will dominate the plate. Success requires that you create a simple plan. You practice making complaints easy and permanent, and most importantly, persist with increasing variety in flavor, color, and texture. These habits will slowly displace the old habits and it is really a super simple thing to do. This is so worth it with all the incredible health benefits that we see. And remember that the best kept secret in medicine is that when left alone, the body will heal itself. So I'd like to say thank you and open it up to questions. And you could find me here at plantbaseddietitian.com. You could find links to all of these things on social media. I love to answer your questions there. And I am happy to answer them wherever you could reach me directly on my website, plantbaseddietitian.com. I work with clients around the world to help them achieve these results. And um, I think it's time for me to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and come back to the room. Juliana, this has been again. Thank you. This was really, really so helpful for so many of us um, and, and just so meaningful. So thank you so, so much. We appreciate that. Thank you, Ben. Um, before we jump into Q and A, um, just wanted to make sure that you just everybody you just saw where you can reach Juliana. Is that the best place to go and find all of your books as well, or is there another place people should go? What, what would you recommend? Yes, all of my books, everything is on my website, plantbaseddietitian.com. All of those things I've talked about, all of those charts, the notable nutrients, the six daily threes, and I do videos all over social media. So I've got these longer videos. I've got reels on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook, and you can find all of those links at plantbaseddietitian.com. And you could contact me directly uh, on the contact page there. So everything is all located right there at plantbaseddietitian.com. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you again. And um, so with that, yeah, if you're ready, we'll, we'll do some Q&A. And just to make sure everybody knows how we go about that here at the Real Truth About Health Conference, um, I do see a few hands have already raised. And that's great. Those folks know what's going on. For those of you that don't, we normally don't take questions directly from the chat box. So what we do is we ask everybody to raise their virtual hand. If you don't know how to do that, uh, you look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen and uh, amongst all the different tabs, there's one that's called reactions. So you click on your reactions tab and your raise hand function will come up along with the other emojis. Click raise hand. We will see your raised hand come in and that means you've got a question. So we will take the raised hands in the order in which they came in. Again, I see a few already up on the screen. And, um, and Juliana, I'll go ahead and unmute people as we take their questions. So we'll set them up. You knock them down, we're good to go, right? Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So first up, we have Joel A. Joel, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Joel. 
Hello, everybody. Juliana, that was an absolutely fantastic presentation. That really was one of the best I've seen. Thank you very much. Uh, but I'm going to make you work for it. So here are two quick questions. <laughs> one is, I've seen Dr. Bolsowitz talk about adding cinnamon, ginger, and turmeric to his oatmeal. And I've also seen videos all over YouTube talking about arsenic and all kinds of problems. How do we have any idea what we're doing when we go to the market to buy some of these ingredients? That's one question. And the other is, uh, there seems to be a great controversy about EPA and DHA. And the issue seems to be that there are some studies that show increased uh, risk of prostate cancer from supplementation. So that's the question, you know, uh, you know, should we be taking this, not taking this, or how, how do we have any idea what the right thing to do is? Well, thank you so much, Joel, for your wonderful, kind comments and for your great questions. These are very, very good questions. And I love herbs and spices and cinnamon and turmeric are, have been shown to have all sorts of anti-inflammatory properties. That's why I include herbs and spices in my list. So incorporate those. That's fabulous and enjoy them and however you enjoy them. And it's great and oats oh, great and however you like to do it. There's again, there's no perfect way to do it. And because we don't know exactly, right. We don't know exactly, um, all those things, like how much arsenic is in this dose of rice. So what I suggest, cause you know, we don't know exactly, we're not measuring every, cause we're all getting our sources from different places and we mix and match and every day is a little bit different. I just say mix and match. And like, for instance, I will do, I'll buy rice from one company and the next time I'll buy it from a different company or I won't do rice every day and I won't do spinach every day. I mix and match the different things. So you get a combination of those things. And hopefully, hopefully overall it works out, but like, we really aren't going to know exactly. And we can't, we can't, we just, we can't. Um, and so, and how much do you want to worry about? Cause stress is also not good for us. So we don't want to stress too much. So I would say variety is really important and, uh, you know, try it all and, and limit and, and mix it up. That's, that's the only way I really know how to answer that because I don't know how to make it perfect. I wish I did. In terms of the omega threes, we don't know. So I don't I haven't even seen the literature on increased risk for prostate cancer. I would love to see that. So I will dig into that. Um, but we don't know. So what we're most of us are just kind of we've kind of all talked together, we conspire together. And so what we have kind of come to is just I have my client supplement a few times a week, sometimes, you know, like three or four times a week. And then it's kind of like a moderation approach. I know there's no such thing as moderation, really. But it's when I was in grad school, my favorite professor always said balance, variety, and mod moderation, balance, variety, and moderation. And it's a good tenet to live by because we can't be perfect. And that's, that's just what I do is just try to mix it up and, and just be mindful and keep looking at the literature and keep looking at things. And if you're eating a little bit different every day, then you're kind of giving, you're going to be the best sum of those different parts. Thank you so much for that, Juliana. Uh, up next, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, Annette M. Annette, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Annette. Hi. Well, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions related to lemon. Um, I've been on my plant-based journey for almost a year. It'll be a year in May. And when I started that, I've been using lemons on my salad every day. And a couple of weeks ago, we started drinking lemon water in the morning with half of a fresh squeezed lemon in our water. And my, uh, my two questions are, one, is all this lemon going to be bad for my teeth? Because I want to keep my teeth great and I'm a little concerned. And the second one is, is there any real benefit to having the lemon water as far as releasing toxins and aiding in your digestion? Oh, Annette, thank you for those questions. And uh, it's a very important question because yes, that is very risky on your teeth and it does degrade the enamel. And that's one of the pitfalls of a, a very raw diet is all, all like the very high fruit diet is the risk on the enamel. So it is an issue. And maybe use a straw with your lemon water if you want to try to avoid your teeth, but it can be an issue. So you need to be careful with it. You're supposed to rinse with water afterwards and um, not necessarily brush. I've heard that before, but I would talk to your dentist about that. But the question is, do you need to have all that lemon? I mean, it's great, got all that vitamin C. And when you put it over a salad, it's going to help you absorb some of the iron, which is wonderful. But do you need all of that in, as, as lemon water? I like to think, I, I don't think we detoxify. We do. Our bodies are made to detoxify. Our bodies are brilliant. We try to micromanage our bodies, but our bodies are way more brilliant than we give it credit for. And 
We have our skin and we have our liver and we have our kidneys and those are organs of detoxification. So like I said, my very last sentence was that if left alone, our bodies will heal itself. That it means not bombarding our body with animal products, highly processed foods, you know, cigarette smoke, too much alcohol, too much of anything, ta- uh, chemicals. You know, I always think of it like the bucket theory, you know, this, I was taught this when I was a kid um, by an, uh, immunologist when I went to talk about my allergies and it's this idea of a bucket and we fill our, you know, we can't avoid everything, right? We live in this world. We can't be in a bubble. When I became a mom, all I wanted to do was put my children in a bubble. Cause I was so freaked out by all the stuff I learned about what's in our environment, but there's toxins in our air and our water in our everywhere. There are toxins and pollutants and viruses and bacteria and microbes and fun- there are stuff everywhere. And so what are you going to do with that? Right? You can only do so much. So you do your best. And so when you remove what you can, and when you flood yourself with the good stuff, you know, that is how you enable your body to detoxify maximally optimally. There is no perfect. And uh, so I would say, be careful of your teeth. I don't think lemon is, there is no superfood that's going to cure everything. It's a preponderance of what you do. It's a preponderance of what you avoid and what you include that makes you the, who you are for long-term health. And so don't worry about being perfect and congratulations on starting a plant-based site. That's, I think the best thing you could do for yourself overall. And, um, and it doesn't have to be one superfood or all these foods, keep it, keep it simple. And if that's going to hurt your teeth and, you know, maybe, maybe just have it once a day or just have it in your salad. But, um, I don't think it's going to be a magic cure-all to anything. Thanks very much for that, Juliana. Um, up next, we have Stephanie P. I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Stephanie. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Juliana. Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions. Um, I just was interested in getting your take on intermittent fasting because I'm just new back to being vegan again, and I'm still trying to you know, get some excess weight off to get healthy. And I noticed in your presentation, you had a lot of foods that you have to kind of get in every day to be balanced. And I find when I do a feeding window, it's harder to get like all the nutrients in because you have less time to eat. So like, I don't know what's more important, giving, getting everything in or kind of doing the fasting, the aid weight loss. What's your take on that? Thank you, Stephanie. I love this question. And we not, I'm going to do a talk called the Choosing Now Diet based on my book, the Choosing Now Diet. I'm not going to pull it up, but my Choosing Now Diet book is all about this. And I use three components for weight loss. This is, it's like a weight loss specific book. This is what I do with my clients. And my clients predictably lose 0.4 to 0.8 pounds a day of body fat, predictably. And so, um, so there's a lot to unpack with what you said. So first the weight loss part. Um, yes, you can do that. And, and when you're on a weight loss, when you're losing weight, you need to separate nutritional optimization. So take a period of time, focus on the weight loss, and then get back to like optimizing, getting all the six daily threes and and just making your nutrition more perfect. You have to create a deficit during weight loss. So I'm going to dive into that in my next talk. And that's what my book is about. It talks all about that in terms of time restricted feeding. That is one of the components I use. So I use three components for weight loss with my clients, whole food plant-based diet, of course, time restricted eating, and mindfulness techniques. So I'm going to dive into all of that, but because you're asking about the time restricted feeding, I love time restricted feeding, not only for weight loss, but there are so many advantages coming out of the literature for eating on a restricted time window. I mean, like most of us eat from the moment we wake up until the moment we go to bed and we don't give ourselves any time off from the fed state. So I highly recommend that I'm going to talk more about that next week. Um, but it's really healthy. And so you don't have to get all of the nutrients all of the day, you know, all day, every single day, it doesn't have to be perfect, but prioritize those six daily threes eat within a fasted window. I do. I love to eat one meal a day. Sometimes I do too. And if someone would have told me this six years ago, seven years ago, I would have thought that was insane. Cause I eat the six meals a day as a personal trainer, but, um, I eat, I eat one or two meals a day and I keep it within a four to six hour window. I have, if I do two meals, I have my clients do that as well. You know, the time you have off from eating because eating is so labor intensive for the body and it just shunts all the, so much blood and energy and time into digesting and absorbing. If you have that time off, you get to get rid of cancer cells and microbes and, you know, and there's just all this wonderful things that can take place when you're not eating. So I highly recommend time restricted feeding long-term, not just for weight loss, but for, for overall health. And it basically it's a way to implement the benefits that we see in fasting 
in a day-to-day basis in the least pain, painful way. You know, I don't, it's hard to go three for me. It's hard to go three days without eating. I know a lot of people love it and it's great. I think it's wonderful, but this is a way to do it on a daily basis where you take time off your body can do all that wonderful healing and, and health promoting stuff. And then you could enjoy still a nutritionally dense meal. And then when you're eating like that, every bite matters. So you have less room for, you know, those treat foods and that's okay because we don't need those treat foods anyway. So it's, it's a great, it's a great practice. I highly recommend it. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you so much for that. And up next, we have uh, someone with the initials MA. I will unmute you now. Hi, welcome. Thank you um, for your presentation, Juliana. Um, so you talked about supplements, you know, B12, vitamin D, K, zinc, iodine, EPA. Um, rather than having six bottles, um, could you uh, and tell me slowly so I can write it down, one or two manufacturers of a vitamin that's for vegans so that it has those specific six ingredients in one capsule? Great question. I've been on this mission to find the perfect supplement for 17 years. And I've talked to many companies, worked with many companies. Now is a great time. There are so many companies out there that are doing this. So if you just look at those notable nutrients, I don't really want to recommend anything kind of publicly, but um, I do, you know, there's, there's a couple of them. If you message me, I'll, me I'll answer your question, but um, I would look for those ingredients and look for the one that you like that's accessible to you. There are some out there now that are good and um, they're getting better. I'll say that. Thank you so much for that, Juliana. And up next we have Joy K. Joy, I'm going to unmute you now. Welcome, Joy. Well, thank you for welcoming me. Thank you for a thorough and thoroughly enjoyable presentation. My question is for a person who takes Synthroid for thyroid nodules, is iodine indicated or contraindicated for such a situation? Well, you need to, thank you, Joy. That's a very good question. And you definitely need iodine. Now, iodine is very important for your thyroid health, but you need to ask your physician about any contraindications for your specific medication. I know that with Synthroid, Synthroid is going to be responsible for your your thyroid function, but iodine is still an essential nutrient. So I would talk to your physician. I don't want to ever make recommendations based on medications because that's uh, outside of my scope of practice, but I'm, I'm, there's gotta be a way to get iodine that you need. So if you want to get it from a whole food source, instead, you could just use a sprinkle of iodized salt in your diet, or you could look at the um, sea vegetables and just do it from that rather than supplementing, but probably a supplement is fine. I would definitely talk to your healthcare provider, um, specifically about your medication and your dose and all that, just to confirm that. Thanks, Juliana. Um, up next, we have Denise R. Denise, I will unmute you now and welcome. What's your question? Hi, Denise, are you with us? Oh, gosh. So, Denise, hopefully you can hear me. I see we have unmuted you, but we're not hearing you. Um, I'm going to just move on to the next person, but I wonder if you can. Uh, I'm going to lower your hand and if you can maybe work out that issue on your end and then jump back on with another hand raise and we'll try to get right back to you. Uh, let me do that. And so next we have uh, Janet P. And Janet, hi. Hi, thank you, Juliana. Great presentation. My question is regarding families that want to transition to a plant-based diet and they have, uh, you know, children at any age. I'm, um, you know, some people come to me and ask me since um, I, uh, you know, have been doing this for a few years and they, they say their kids don't like vegetables. They're used to, you know, the American diet. How do you do you have any suggestions of how parents can transition their families and do they need the same supplements as adults or do children need different, do you have sources on your website as far as what children at different ages uh, are recommended as far as the supplements? Thank you so much, Janet. That's a great question. Uh, on my website, in my actually in the Plant-Based Nutrition Idiot's Guide, I, in both editions, the original and the second edition, I have that back there. Um, I have a whole section for families, for kids, for baby infants, for pregnancy, then infants, and then um, 
across the lifespan. That's that's laid out in the plant based nutrition idiots guide, and that's still available. That was updated a couple of years ago, year and a half ago, and um, for families transitioning, here's what I've worked with families. I've worked with families now for many, many, many years, helping the transition process. Here is the the most successful highlights. It's everyone on the families on the same page. The parents are, are the 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 people that are parenting and in charge of food in the home are all on the same page. That's number one. Otherwise it's really hard myself included. I went through this with my ex-husband. <laughs> so anyway, um, if everyone's on the same page, it is so easy because I've seen so many families where they're like, they want to do this and they're doing this. And this is what we eat. And this is our food. And, and the kids are like, Oh, this is what we eat. And they just enjoy eating this way. And so the transition looks like the same thing as you would do by yourself. You're finding recipes that you love. And then you find recipes that your children love and more children friendly recipes. That's also all of this is in my book. The nutrition, just the nutrition, by the way, is all in the book too. And, um, it children need less, but depending on their age. So I don't want to just give out nutrients. Each one I'll be, will be here all day. That is like, I just use the, I, the Institute of medicine recommendations for dosing for children's nutrients, but yeah, they need less there are children's supplements specifically for vegan children. That is, is really important for if they're for the multivitamin, but in terms of the diet, they need the same types of food. They're, they're probably going to eat less because they're smaller people, but it depends on their age and it changes throughout the lifespan. The, the keys to helping the children transition, not only are the parents being on the same page, it's about getting them involved. I, I did a video with my daughter. I love it because now she's bigger than me. My kids are now bigger than me. It's so weird. But when my daughter was tiny, we did this little kids cook Monday video and we were making pasta and she was so tiny and just getting them involved in the kitchen is very helpful. You know, like getting them to like get excited about different ingredients or having them grow a garden or an herb garden or going to a farmer's market. I used to take my kids to a farmer's market uh, begrudgingly, but you know, they didn't get as excited as I was hoping, but most of the kids that I work with, they do some kids that they want to be in the kitchen, actually cooking and putting together things or being responsible for choosing the recipes that they're eating. The other thing that seems to be very successful is having either a buffet of all the healthy foods, you know, available. And so that the kids get to choose on their plate, um, not having junk food in the house. Oh my gosh. That was my big concern with my, my house was that I had all this healthy food in the house. And then the said X would bring in the, the junk food. And of course the kids are going to choose the junk food. So you want, if you ideally can, you have a very colorful house and kitchen filled with all of these like ready to grab veggies and hummus and guacamole and things that kids like kids love to dip kids love you know like celery sticks with peanut butter and raisins on top like fun things that kids will enjoy making their own pizzas making their own taco bar making their own burrito bar make it fun and delicious and nutritious and it's just oh and when you're at the table you know here's the other analogy is that or not analogy. This is what a lot of people do. The, the mom's over there eating, you know, her, you know, bread and butter. And she's saying, eat your broccoli, eat your broccoli. But the kid's like, well, I just want the bread and butter. So you have to be the, the most important thing is to be the lighthouse, not the tugboat to be the example of what your want, kids want to do. And they will do as you do rather than do as you say, you know, that we're all like that. We, we watch and we're taking it in. Kids are taking it in so profoundly. And so be the, be what you want your child to be. That's the case for everything in life, right? But especially with how you're eating, they're watching you. And just, you know, when you're sitting there going, oh my gosh, this broccoli is so delicious. Like, and then, you know, they're going to be like, oh, it's delicious. I want to, is that really delicious? Let me try that. You know, unless you're like, oh, I'm eating my broccoli because I have to eat my broccoli. They're going to see that too. So it's all about your attitude and how excited you get about the food and what you have available to them. Kids are very malleable. And of course, when they go out in the real world, it's impossible to keep them in that bubble. So give them a foundation at home. But oh my gosh, I've seen so many families and I've helped so many families transition to this way of life. And I've watched, it's so cute because now it's been so many years I've been doing this, but I've watched, I've had clients come to me pregnant and then they went through the breastfeeding and then they went through the, you know, the toddlerhood and the kids going to school. And then it's just so fun to watch them across the lifespan, eat this way and adopt this way of eating. And they all grow up healthy and strong and they all become athletes and they all, you know, they're all, you don't, you know, they grow up just as tall and big and strong as the omnivorous, their omnivorous friends but um, they have this special place in their heart for eating a healthy diet that is also very light on the planet. And it's a wonderful, wonderful gift you can give to your children. Very, very sage advice. Thank you so much for that, Juliana. Um, Denise is back. Denise, right, let's see if we can get this working this time. Denise, I just unmuted you. Are you there? Can you hear me? 
We got you. Welcome. Okay, great. I just first want to say to Juliana, we're so lucky, the plant-based community, to have you and to advise us. So thank you so much. I want to just follow up a little bit on bone health. I am a petite, almost 70-year-old woman who has been eating whole food plant-based for a long time, but I always still worry about bone health and because of those osteoporosis, you know, designations and all that. So first, uh, could you possibly, uh, I'll just say them all, it's just all related to this. Uh, could you give a suggested supplement dose for K2? I actually found a, a D3 K2, but I have no idea really what the K2 dose is supposed to be. And then, you know, I noticed that you said you don't drink plant milk. I actually do. I drink unsweetened soy milk. And I do hear a lot of the doctors talking about, you know, that it's, uh, we can get our calcium, you know, from fortified non-dairy milks. And then I've heard a little bit like, well, maybe you shouldn't get it from that because it's fortified and it's not like from the whole food. And so I was wondering, you know, what you might know about that, because I do use like drinking soy milk as one of my ways to get the calcium, because it's about 300 milligrams, you know, for a cup. And uh, I'll sometimes, you know, maybe throughout my day through it, I use it for oatmeal and some other things, I might have two cups. So is that an issue? Um, and the last quick one is, somebody asked me when we're eating low and high oxalate greens together, like spinach, and let's say collards, is our body going to absorb the calcium from the collards, even though it won't absorb it from the spinach at the same time in the same way? So those are my questions. K2, fortified soy milk, and uh, absorbing the greens and the, the calcium. Thank you, Denise. Those are fantastic questions. So important. I really appreciate you bringing all that to the forefront. I don't know the K2 supplement dose that's ideal. I don't know if we have that. Um, now the latest I've checked, I don't know the actual dose. So I just take the supplement that I know has a good dose. I could, I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head. So I will, if you reach out to me, I will look up some more information and see if there's any updates on that information. I'm happy to answer that if I can. Um, the soy milk would be a great choice for what you're saying. Yes, you're getting the calcium, but also soy foods themselves are associated with improved uh, bone density as well. So that's important. And let's talk about bone health because it is so important. So multifactorial. I have a video um, called Strong Bone Stir Fry. And if you guys want to see that, that's on social media. Or I'll send it to you. Um, that, that summarizes all of these ideas all in a one stir fry recipe, <laughs> because there's all these different factors that come into play. Fragility is a real high risk um, for humans, for mortality. And we get more fragile as we get older. Of course, we lose bone density, we lose muscle density. One of the most important things you can do for bone health is exercise beyond nutrition. I think this is one thing that is most important is, well, you need the nutrition too. It's, it works together, but you need to have um, resistance exercise against your bones to maintain bone density. The bone is fluid. You're getting bone, bone cells coming in and out. The osteoblasts come in osteoclasts, all this whole functions that take place throughout the day. It's a, a dynamic thing, which was so interesting when I finally, I didn't know that I thought bones are just bones and then you grow them and then you lose them, but it's not that simple. And so it, because of that dynamism, you know, having the resistance exercise on a regular basis is very, very important. So walking, running, if you can, a little rebounder, jumping, um, skipping, <laughs> or, uh, and then weightlifting resistance training, really, really helpful for bone health and for muscle strength, of course, maintaining muscle mass as we age. Now, nutritionally speaking, calcium, hundred percent, we need calcium. So you want to have foods like soy milk, fortified plant milk. That's great that you have. It. It's great. I'm just saying, I don't use it like that, but it is definitely a good source for uh, calcium. Almonds, uh, sesame seeds and tahini, oranges, dried figs, other, those are other great sources of calcium as well. Um, and then, yeah, you know, just making sure you're getting different uh, versions of it, the leafy green vegetables. I don't know. That's a great question about if you have the leafy greens combined, what happens in the, what happens once it gets down there through the GI tract, I would guess that those oxalates are present and it might decrease the absorption. That's just my, I'm just guessing. Um, Cause I don't know if that study has been done, but I would definitely have uh, meals where you don't have any of the high oxalate foods, the high oxalate greens, just to make sure, again, that's where I go into the variety and moderation balance idea, um, goal. And because we don't know that information, maybe we know that information, but that would be an interesting study. Um, 
mix it up, mix it up. Try to get those, those high oxalate greens, make those rare, rare on uh, special occasion types of greens. Cause you know, sometimes you want a good spinach. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one thing to think about. And, um, what else? Did I want to make sure I, add? oh, another other things with bones is making sure your B12 is optimal. That's another reason for B12. We need B12 as part of those cascading effects. We need our vitamin D serum levels to be optimal. You want to make sure in your blood work that you're optimal so that you absorb it. Cause no matter how much calcium you consume, you may not absorb it. Oh, another great source is tofu, calcium, uh, laid to tofu, calcium set tofu is a great source of calcium as well. But if you're taking in all the thousand milligrams of 12, milligrams a day of calcium. If your D levels aren't optimal, it's not even going to more, it's not even going to matter. So making sure all of that's in, in, um, coming into, you know, all beautifully synergistic things. If you do all of those together, that should help with bone health, but it is a complicated issue. One more thing is when you're eating your healthy, nutritious beans and greens and lentils and, and um, leafy greens and all that separate tea and coffee because that can actually inhibit absorption as well. So have your coffee, that's fine. Have it later or earlier and then give yourself a, an hour or so and then have your meal with all those foods just to separate that to make sure you get maximal new, uh, mineral and uh, vitamin absorption. Excellent, Juliana, thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, we have another question now from Nicole F. Nicole, I'm gonna unmute you. Hi, Nicole. Hi there, um, thanks for the inspirational talk. I'm calling from Germany actually, and we have like the hugest bread selection as you may know. So I was wondering, could you um, tell us, tell me or tell us about what you think about bread? I mean, we have like really good whole grain bread. I'm not talking about the white stuff. Um, we have that too, but we have really delicious good bread. So what, what about bread? Would you say no, yes, slice a day or a slice a week, something like that. Um, and yes, I do have a couple of pounds to drop. So uh, <laughs> bear that in mind as well. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. And hello in Germany. And uh, the only time I was in Germany, I need to spend more time there, but I stopped there once in an airport. That's what I had was a pretzel. <laughs> I wanted to taste the bread because I know about that. I've heard about it. And um, bread is amazingly delicious. It's also very easy to overeat, first of all. Uh, because it's refined, right? And if you're trying to lose weight, I don't do bread during weight loss, but okay. So let's just separate this because it's important. If you're on a whole food plant-based diet, there's absolutely room for whole grain bread. There's sprouted breads. I recommend the sprouted breads as the best choice um, for more of a staple food um, as sprouted as, as, you know, hearty as you can would be the choice for bread. But if during weight loss, I don't use any flours at all for weight loss. So I would have you take that off to take that out of your diet until you could get those couple of pounds that you said you want to get rid of. And you could bring it back in, you know, small doses as a uh, sprouted or whole as whole grain as possible. Now, um, I mean, yeah, flours, I just don't I on weight loss in choose you now diet, what I do is no oils, no refined sugars, low sodium and no flowers just during the weight loss process. But then once you're not doing that and you're in regular maintenance mode, which is hopefully the rest of your life, I like people to get weight loss over with and then move on with their life. So it's not this, that roller coaster that many of us have been on for so many years. So you just separate that. Um, but whole grain bread is delicious. If you can keep it and you're at your healthy weight and uh, it could be part of your whole food plant-based diet, if it works for you and whole grain pastas, stuff like that. Um, it's great once in a while, depending on what your goals are. Juliana, thank you. Um, that is tremendous. And this whole thing has been sensational for us. We're really, really thankful. Um, that, that was the last of our questions. And, um, uh, you know, before we move on to our next lecture in, in about 12 minutes, I want to say thank you. And I'm sure you know, I am not the only one that wants to say thank you. So I'm going to ask our tech team to unmute our entire audience. What does everybody want to say to you? <laughs> <laughs>